Okay. Um, so my talk is going to be on uh, the security mechanisms that exist and um, the work that I've been doing over what was meant to be about a week, but ended up taking several months, uh, both due to um, time constraints on my part and um, the realization that there was much more work that was involved than what I initially had. <coughs> um, so if you came here two years ago, um, I gave a presentation on security, uh, where we basically rewrote part of the security system and made it much more robust. <coughs> At the same time, we left scope in there for doing some future work uh, where we could do some very, very interesting things with permissions that exist. And uh, basically, I've now had the chance to um, do that piece of work. Uh, what I should really do is um, acknowledge uh, Joe Mikachowski um, from the Office of the Historian. Uh, he agreed to sponsor me for about one week's work to do this. Um, and he's got a pretty good deal out of it. Um, he's got a lot of work out of it. Um, not that he asked for that, but um, I like fixing things in open source projects and there's much to do. So I think it benefits everybody. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about um, correctness of um, how Exist did or did not treat certain file permissions when you're doing things and um, what I've done to resolve those. Security model that exists. The idea is that it's based off of the Unix security model um, with a couple of deviations. Uh, but apart from those known deviations, it should pretty much follow whatever happens in Unix slash Linux. And um, when I started implementing some of this stuff, I was seeing some strange things happening. <coughs> and, um, I quickly realised that in a couple of places, our Unix-like security model wasn't Unix-like enough. Uh, so it was doing something that I didn't expect. So. Um, if I create a file in Unix, um, who knows what, so, so this is kind of quiz, so I want to be a little bit interactive. Uh, who knows what the owner of the mode would be if I create a new file in a Unix or Linux system? Isn't there a kind of default? You, you. Yeah, there's, there's a kind of default. Yeah. Anyone has, interact, has a guess. Uh, I won't tell you what being wrong. Depends on the UMask. Depends on the UMask, yeah, the UMask is involved. Close. 755, <laughs> five. most likely 755 as the mode. So uh, the owner has you know, complete access and others have read and execute access. And um, who is the owner if I create a file? Group. Mm -hmm. And group that's assigned to that as well? What's the group? Where does that come from? Users of the primary group. Users of primary group. So it's, yeah, it's empty group. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting, okay, yep, so owner is the current user and the current group. Well, the mode is whatever the default mode happens to be with the new mask subtracted. Uh, typically, that's 755. So what does it exist do? It does the right thing. It's really good news, okay. Uh, so, this is good. Okay, we're off to a good start. So, how about copying files? So, if I have a file, and I copy it from, if I own this file, right? and I have this mode, and another user comes along, user B, and they have read access on this file, and they make a copy of the file. Who, who is the owner of the copy of the file? The user. user. Yeah. Yeah. And the one argument. People, some people are, what do you think about this? So you're saying, no. no, yes? No? Who do you think it is? Should be the format. So you think it's like a book, you're, if you're copying it, no. So you think the owner is preserved? I want you to pass it. Okay. If you move, yes. Copy, okay. though. So I want to copy. We've got some people saying it's the guy that's done the copy, right? The copy belongs to the guy that's done the copy. And some people saying copy belongs to the original author of the file. Okay. Um, actually, this side of the room is correct. So the copy belongs to the person that's done the copy on the end. And this, there's, there's a really good reason for that, which we'll come to. Um, but what does exist do? I wonder. Okay, so uh, it does it wrong. 
So it shows exactly what the boundary says, um, which is not the right thing to do. So uh, if you copy previously, this is now fixed in the 2.2 Greece candidate one that Paul Gain was mentioning. Uh, previously, if you copy the file or collection in a uh, document or collection in exists, uh, it would copy the permissions from the original document to the new document. Um, this is really a problem because um, if I, for example, photocopy something, right, um, I can get the header and then scribble all over it, right? It's my copy, belongs to me. Um, it exists if I copy a file, uh, I can't really change it, right? It still belongs to the other person. Or well, I can change it, but then they can just change it back, right? It's not mine, it's, it's theirs. Um, so this, like, this notion of copying is kind of broken unless you own the copy. And then what do you mean with, with copying? Is that with the XMLDB copy function? Yeah. Because you can always read it into memory and write it out again, and then it's yours, isn't it? No, it wasn't previously. Okay. So if you copy the file or collection exists, whether you use XMLDB copy or the internal API tool or, or the admin client or the dashboard or, or whatever you want to do, it all goes through the database broker. And the database broker would copy the permissions from the old files that you've got. Um, so you never really own the copy. Uh, so this becomes problematic when you have lots of users that are trying to work on documents collaboratively and they want to create copy, edit it, and then send it back. They can't really do this edit set so easily unless you relax the permissions on the document, right? So you have to have a common group and really have to have right access in the group. You shouldn't leave that. Uh, so it was, it was kind of incorrect. It wasn't bad. We had security and it worked as long as you knew how to use it, but it wasn't what you would expect. Okay? So it now is what you expect. If I copy a file on a Mac, I see this. If I copy a file on exist, I see this. This is, this is a good thing. Um, so yeah, the big basic problem. You copy a file, it's not yours. It's not private to you, you can't update it, you can't change the permissions so someone can't access your copy, this kind of thing. Right? Because only an owner can change the permissions of a file or a DBA. So if you copy a file and don't own it, you can't change its permissions. So it's not your file. Yeah. Um, so that's when you're copying a file to an empty destination, right? You're not replacing an existing file. How about if I've got file A here and file A over here in a different collection? I want to copy this file A over this file A. What, what do you think should happen? Change the permissions of the file A in the, the destination. In Unix or exist? In Unix, that's what it does. Yes, that is exactly what it does in Unix. And what do we think it doesn't exist? Another check we shouldn't be doing. 
Um, and basically, we just tell the system that it elevates privileges for the moment that it needs them and then it pulls them back again. That works quite well. So, the result. You can now copy things where you should be able to copy things before, but you couldn't. Um, you can't steal people's files. Um, and if you copy something, it belongs to you. Okay, so lots and lots of fixes in this area. And it's really kind of, um, I think, fundamental in any application where you're working with documents like Metamount Database, where you a lot of the operations of copying files, creating files, moving files, actually. Especially in, uh, for example, I guess it's uh, Tamboti, right? Lots of users share files, they have copies of files, they edit them, they submit them back into the project. Okay, but we have some intentional differences when compared to Unix. So in Unix, if you attempt to copy a directory structure and you don't have read access on some of the files you're copying within that directory structure, or you don't have write access on some of the destinations, you will end up with half of the stuff being copied, or a bit of it, but not all of it. Okay. Now, that's arguably okay if you can trace back, you know, what did I get? What didn't I get? It becomes a bit tricky. Um, so in this case, we actually do an upfront check of all of the permissions before we do a copy. Okay. There's a downside. Okay. The downside is it takes a little bit longer to do the copy because you have to check the best data on all the resources that are involved in all the destinations. The upside is that it reduces the likelihood of the copy failing to copy the file, all of the files. Right. If I'm going to do a copy, I really want it to be atomic. Right. I've got it, or I haven't got it. I don't want half my files and half of someone else's files that I didn't have permission. The problem is that at the moment it's not foolproof. Because to do that, I would have to lock the database to ensure that nobody changes the destination or the source whilst I'm doing the copy operation. Um, I could do that, um, but it's going to have more of an impact than I would like on the performance of Exist and other operations that are happening in the database. So to really be atomic, um, locking isn't really an option because that there's too much overhead, I would need to go to something like copy on write. So you're doing the copy on a previous revision of the database, and if someone modifies it, they have a different view of the database. So but that's quite a lot of effort involved there. So at the moment, I've passed that. But we can think about that. So what you have at the moment is you have a decent chance of getting a complete copy. And if you don't get a complete copy, it just will certainly tell you about it. Okay. So it's not like you copy half it and you didn't know that half it was which is, so defaults back to what Unix does, right? Copy some of the stuff, throw it out. But maybe you'll get it, it's a good chance. Depends how loaded your system is and what other interactions are. So. so after, that actually took quite a lot better to um, fix those copy bytes. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it wasn't entirely easy to do. And so I ended up adding I don't know, 60 or 100 test cases around copying to basically prove that I had this correct. As long as my test case is correct, of course, my state of my test cases. Um, so I haven't had time to look at moving files. Um, so I don't know if when you move files in existence at the moment, it does the right thing. I have a feeling <coughs> that if the destination isn't there and you move a file, it probably does the right thing, right? It moves the original file and its permissions to the destination. It's fairly simple operation. If the existing destination already exists, does exist modify the mode and permissions on the destination or not? I haven't had time to look into this. So that's something that I'd like to do. Uh, it may be that it's already right, it may be that it's not, I'm not certain. So this is kind of uh, all of this security correctness was kind of a precursor to the thing that I wanted to do. Uh, but when I was doing the thing that I wanted to do, all of this was going wrong and I was seeing strange permissions everywhere, so I had to go back and fix all of this first. So, um, the really interesting thing, I think, in this talk is the identity part. So, um, when running a process inside Exist, um, Exist knows uh, about the user, okay, the brand this process. So that's the identity. Um, and what is that? Okay, so by default, Exist only knows about what identity in the process, okay, which is who launched the process. Okay. 
by default, in Exist, which is the right thing, everything is unprivileged. Okay? You're always the guest user, unless you've authenticated in some way. It's very important. You don't want to be the admin user unless you've authenticated with somebody else. Right? Um, so, and this is absolutely true for everything in Exist because it's done very low down in, in the database broker, which is used by everyone. So it's nice and safe. And it has been fairly safe for quite a long time now. We had some privilege escalation bugs many years ago in 140 or thereabouts, I think. They got owned out quite quickly. Um, so it's, it's quite robust. However, um, it's not really enough. Okay. So what happens if I want to run processes as different users or have a process escalate privilege, privileges in a safe way? Okay. Because it's nice that everything starts off as the guest user, but how do I change that right? Guest users can't really do anything in the database, hopefully. So um, I need some sort of authentication mechanism. And there's kind of two ways to do it, and there's two different parts of how an expert run in, runs and exists, uh, which limits your options on what you can do. So uh, if you're interact if you're sort of in a sort of interactive session with the database, um, you can do challenge response authentication. Okay? So if you issue a HTTP request to exist, um, it can send you a 401 back and you can supply a username or password. You can even supply the username or password up front if you want to preempt the challenge response. Okay? And that, that works, okay, that's there today, it's fairly robust, it's quite nice. Um, or there's what I like to call the evil option. Um, which is that within your XQuery code, you can call XML DB login, or you can use system as user. Now, XML DB login changes the user that's running the query. Okay. And what you need for that is you need a username of a user, and you need a password for the user. Which is interesting, because your password has to be supplied to that function in plain text. Where do I keep this password? Do I keep it hard coded in my XQuery script? Do I put it into a document in the database that has guest access because my script is running as guest? Uh, somewhere you're going to be keeping a password unencrypted. Uh, exist in its password database is all encrypted, but how do, I, how do I log in if I don't know what the user's real password is? It's a bit nasty. Uh, so XMLDB login will escalate the privileges for the entire execution of the remaining query, whereas system as user will execute a code block as that user. They're very quick and one operates on the entire query, the other operates on a block of code within the query. But yeah, I don't like this. You have to somehow keep your passwords somewhere to us. Um, so that's your options if you're interactive. If you're sort of non-interactive, so you schedule an X query job scheduler, or you set up an X query trigger that's cool when some database operation happens, there's no way that you can authenticate dynamically at that point. I mean, um, interactively at that point, right? Well, you, you can't pop up a dialog box to the user that's running on some server somewhere. Nothing would work. Um, so your only real option there is the evil one. Um, and the only reason it's evil is because of this plain text password. Okay? It works, there's nothing really wrong with it apart from you keep your credentials. Um, so something has to be improved here, right? So um, we did some stuff. So what we do now is we store two identities during processing. Uh, if you look at Unix, it stores more than two identities, uh, but it has definitely these two, the real user and the effective user. And in Exist, this is enough, really, to allow us to do fairly secure privilege escalation and stuff. So um, the real user is what, if you ignore the effective user, the real user is what Exist always had before. Okay, it's the guy that initiated the process, it's the real person. Um, and then the effective user is the what you effectively escalated your privileges to. Okay. So um, you start the query as a real user, it runs either as the real user, or if you do some sort of escalation, it runs to the effective user. And when it tries to access documents and collections in the database, it will have the effective user's permissions. Um, so, by default, um, to maintain backwards compatibility, this new effective user that we know about when we're executing a process is the same as the real user, unless you escalate the privileges. So how do I uh, 
escalate my privileges. I have like a common effective user as opposed to a real user. Um, well, two years ago I was here talking about uh, permissions can exist and the sort of um, rewrite that we did there. And what we really did is we went from having a very, very simple uh, file mode that exists, which was read, write, update, to having the full Unix mode. Uh, so we have read, write, execute, set UID, set GID, and sticky bit. Um, and it turns out that even though we didn't expose those to the users at the time, or really didn't <coughs> want those set UID or set GID bits, they were, they were there, right? we knew we were going to do something. So um, set UID and set GID bits allow you to escalate your privileges to an effective user okay, in a safe manner. So okay, this is the plan. If you find it's not safe, please let me know. So okay, we've now implemented set UID and set GID. So what, what does that mean? I'll explain exactly what set UID and set GID are and how they work. Um, but it affects process. So whether it's a trigger or it's something called by rest or, or whatever. Um, it allows you to have an effective user. And interestingly, not set UID, but set GID, you can also set on a collection. And it does some pretty interesting and funky stuff. And we'll look at that so set UID, set GID, uh, simply acronyms for set user ID and set group ID. Um, set UID changes the effective user process execution. Um, you can do the same thing with set GID, but you can also change the owner group on created sub-resources or collections. So if I set GID on a collection, when I create a new resource inside that collection, or a new collection inside that collection, or I copy some other stuff into that collection, it modifies what's going to happen with the permissions. Uh, so what do these things look like? Um, well, we have a Unix-like security model, so we've kept the whole Unix-like thing. So who here is actually familiar with set UID and set GID in Unix? Okay, so one, two, three, four. A few people. Half and half always. Um, so for those of you that already know about this, I'm probably preaching to the converted. For those that don't, I'm going to explain it, so the others please excuse me for a minute. Uh, but basically, if you look at the permissions mode on a collection or a resource, um, and this is a set GID one here, where the execute bit would be. Um, you now have either a capital S or a small S. Okay. So if I have a permissions mode, let's say that it's execute, and I then also set it set GID, I get this small S. Okay. If it's not already execute for the group, and I set it set GID, I get this big S. So the, the S indicates whether it's execute and or set GID. And for a UID, it just happens in the user position of the mask, of the mode, sorry, instead of the group position. And uh, in terms of the optical numbers that people are used to talk about, so, you know, 755 and this kind of stuff, the permissions, uh, you have an extra number at the beginning. So you have four for user set UID, and if that was a two, that would be set UID. So it's exactly the same modes that you used before, and then to turn on set UID or set UID sets to a four or a two. <coughs> so um, I'm just going to show you quite what that looks like in Exist because I had to update quite a few bits of Exist to make this work. So I think I can somehow find the fourth one. that this 
question that I have here is uh, set GI for the body, right, for this test. And uh, a number of tools have been updated so that you can now uh, graphically set these permissions as well as doing it via the uh, functions in the security management module, right? So an SM change model thing that you use to change modes and things. That accepts all of the syntax, it accepts both the optical syntax, the uh, simple string syntax, exists old kind of symbolic syntax. Um, it basically works out which syntax you're trying to use and then parses it and applies it. Uh, but we've updated the admin client, so yeah. Oh, that's on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So we now have we well, always have to rewrite everything. We've now got these special flags that you're using to the ID. So you can play with sticky is not implemented at the moment, so you can turn it on and off, but don't expect it to do anything. Um, it does change the permissions in the database, but because this doesn't act on the CD flag on the CD. Um, so this was what would sticky normally do? Uh, it, it, I believe it's something to do with permissions inheritance, mode permissions. So I haven't gone as far as really looking into it yet. Um, but it's there for a reason, I'm sure. <laughs> so at some point we'll implement it. <coughs> Hopefully it won't take me two years this time. Maybe I'll get it up pretty quickly. Uh, so, um, I think I'm on this screen. Um, so, if we, okay, now this is on this screen. This is really fun. Um, so, let me move this over here. So, okay, I just lost my web browser. So um, in the dashboard exists, uh, you have also the, uh, I don't think I remember where it is, uh, collection browser. Uh, uh, I'll make it smaller. Uh, <laughs> control <laughs> minus. Right? Larger. Uh, 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 control minus. Control minus. Just control minus. Or, uh, uh. It's a good objective. Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Exist 
by the REST server to try to execute this query. I'm going to guess you it. I haven't authenticated. As long as my X query has the set UID bit set and it has execute access for the guest user, then when I launch it from the REST server, it will initially start as the guest user. And when it hangs as the set UID bit, it will effectively become user A. Okay. So my guest user has been able to execute the query as user A. Okay. So that query now has all of the access permissions to the database that user A would have had. Okay. You talk about so, XQuery files, not modules, bro. Uh, from the REST server. Okay. Then 
use ACLs to grant access to those specific services and accounts and groups to your resources, not as the primary thing on your resources, but as an ACL, because you can manage this and you know where it is. So be careful. It's a lot of fun, but there's a lot of danger. So we talked a lot about um, process execution and what set GID and set GID means on that. Uh, set GID, um, and this was never part of the original plan to implement this, but I was having too much fun, so I just went through it anyway. Um, set GID on collections in Unix has a on directories in Unix has a very special meaning, and we carried that through into existence as well. It gives you a little bit more power. Um, so if you set GID on a collection and then someone comes along and has permission to create a resource in that collection. Um, when that resource is created, rather than being owned by the user that created the resource and their primary group, the group owner of that resource is instead the collection's group owner. Okay. And this means you can do some quite interesting things, which I'm not going to mention because they're in the next slide. And basically, very, very similar, if you create a sub-collection in a collection, inside a collection that has Set GID on it. Um, it. Again, it inherits the parent collections group as its own rather than the primary group of the user that created that collection. And it also inherits the set GID bit. So if you set GID on a collection, anybody that creates any collection inside there will also have set GID. So you're kind of saying inside this collection, anything that's created belongs to this group forever until you turn the set GID bit off. Um, just to point out, if you have a collection of documents, and you set GID on it, <coughs> it's not like that's applied to stuff that already exists. Okay? It's only when you apply set GID first and then put documents or collections into that collection that the set GID then is applied. And you can turn it off. So if you create a sub collection and you decide, oh, I don't want this sub collection to set GID, you can just turn the bit off on that. So it's quite flexible. But they're not reapplied retrospectively. And that fits with the whole unit model. So what can we do? Um, it makes it really, really easy to share documents between users and groups in your system. Okay. I can have a collection that a, uh, is set GID, but I don't know, that group might be the editor's group, right? And I allow people to just bung documents into this collection. And every document that goes in there is then owned by the editor's group. So editors have different access rights because that's the permission mask on the node. So you get this, you get exactly basically what we wanted in Tambotti when we started trying to build this project sharing thing right at the beginning. It's just I didn't know that this is what we needed to do. So we did it in a very different way back then. Um, but yeah, it becomes really, really easy to sort of allow people to share groups and create almost a workflow using users and groups about who can edit what and how you move things through the database. Um, again, this can be combined with ACLs. So you can you know, put ACLs onto your collection that has set GID to give other people access to that collection as well. Um, that gets a little bit um, hard to remember what you've done, wrap your head around, but if you get it right, it's about <coughs> um, And of course, you can have an ex-crew who's executing validated privileges that's writing into a collection that has set GID set on it. And then you can combine those two things together. So, your expert, even though it's executing as someone else, might not you know, be able to do something with this particular collection. I mean, they can write into it, but they can't change the permissions of what they write into there. But if you set a set GID, and when they write into there, the group will be changed more. So you can kind of mash all these things up together and do some very interesting things. Um, so I'll stop there. So um, I'm just going to give a little demo of this, but I don't know if I need to, if, or if you want to see it working or not. It's been fairly self-explanatory. Well, it is, as I say, hopefully, unless I really messed up someone. Uh, does anybody want to see it, or shall I continue? I have a few more slides. So, start the slides. I have a question so, for what you've told us so far. One of the reasons uh, I sometimes have to switch to admin user coming in as a normal user is that I have to go to the file system, or the, the process has to go to the file system. You still need admin privileges for that. Is there any yeah, okay. Thing so I can do about that then. There's a lot of functions that exist that we at some point have considered that they could be exploited, particularly mm. things where you're accessing the service file system or something like this. So we've artificially limited them so that you have to be a DBA mm. to 
uh, execute those functions. Um, you could obviously set GID so that when someone runs the next query script, they become a DBA. Um, but I wouldn't give guest access to that. I'd very carefully control who could execute that script. Right? So maybe some authenticated users that I allow to run this particular script as a DBA where they can then read the file from the file system. That's one way you can solve that. I don't think that's the best way. I think there's a much better way, which is to have more fine-grained control over who can execute which functions and why. Um, and I'll actually come to that a little bit in a minute. <laughs> On the file module, I'm the one who raised the concern about that and went and made the changes. Yeah, no, it's, it's, at the moment, it's the right thing to do um, because I don't want users. Because on your server, the existing Java process is executing as whoever you can figure it out. Hopefully, you haven't been dark enough to run it as root. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on my server, I run it as a service account called exist. It's very unprivileged. It only has read and write access to the existing mm -hmm. folder and its data folder, which I keep on a separate drive. For. Um, so that's quite locked down. So if somebody compromised my exist, what can they do with my mm -hmm. server? Well, they can delete my exist installation, but they can't really do much else. Yeah. Maybe fill up my temp directory. Um, so it's not, it's not too bad. And um, Maybe the purpose of artificially mm -hmm. limiting these functions to be a DBA right. is because if any user in exist could run this function, they're then running a mock on your server as the user the mm -hmm. exist process is executing us. Right. Maybe we could put an ACL on the, on that function module. Yeah, so I'll come to this in a minute. Something similar to that, I think, is required. If we want to do this anyway, mm -hmm. maybe set UID, set GID is enough mm -hmm. so people can put little bits into certain scripts and call them. Plus. Put into a function module. It's and, a good start, yeah. mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but it's not a problem. Uh, so I had to change. Considering I've introduced two user identities now, we've got the effective user and we've got the real user that we always had, um, I have to change a few functions that exist so that they don't get confused about who's running what and what they're telling them <coughs> about who's running what. So um, if you remember a few slides back, and I don't blame you, don't, um, what it said is that if there is no difference between the effective user and the real user, okay, you haven't escalated privileges. The effective user is the real user. Okay? They're one of the same unless you escalate the privileges. So previously in Exist, um, these functions at the top here all acted on the real user. Okay? However, when your query is running, it's not necessarily running as the real user anymore, it might be running as the effective user. So these now all act on the effective user. And if you haven't escalated privileges, they will tell you about the real user. Okay? So that's kind of the same. Okay? This is the current state that I want to see. Um, but that gets a little bit tricky because this way we have for determining the user XML DB get current user. If it's only going to tell you about the effective user, how do I know that maybe I'm running the best place privileges or that there's a different real user out there that's started to talk to me? So we have this um, SMID function now, uh, which is called straight out of Unix, basically. Um, that if you follow the Unix, then you type ID. Um, it will tell you the real user. And if there's an effective user, it will also tell you what the effective user is. Um, so this SMID is kind of interesting. It returns a little XML document and um, it tells you the real user and if the effective user is different, it will tell you that and it will tell you their groups. Okay? Because you can make the effective user can basically be a real user augmented with another group. So you need to know what group. Okay. So you can call that and effectively that like, deprecates XML DB user because this tells you exactly what that does plus a bunch more information. Okay, so um, future work. Um, this is all wonderful. I've had a lot of fun doing this, and I hope you have fun using it. However, uh, it's not as far as I want it to go. I want to go further. So, um, one of the major problems is obviously set UID bit and set UID bit static. You have to set these up front and assign mm -hmm. owners and groups to resources. Uh, so, that's not very kind of dynamic, right? So, what happens if I want to, I don't know, create some sort of online system where people sign up online and their permissions are determined based on a series of questions that they answer. Okay. So maybe I can go in and change all the permissions to the database and that kind of thing and then authenticate them. There's probably ways to do it, but it's, it's not particularly great. Okay. We could do better for dynamic side of things. Um, 
So if you want to do dynamic, but main talk about this, you really only have this login as user. They haven't gone anywhere, they're still there. So you could, if you really want to go wild, you could use set UID, set UID, and then in your script also use login and as user to change the user again. Um, but I don't really think it's good enough, um, because I don't like this keeping a password somewhere in plain text. So what I want to do is replace login and as user with sudo. Um, again, completely ripped off from Unix, um, because it works, and it does work very well, so I'm not going to prevent something new. Um, there's a couple of things that I have to do. One is implement the function, that's very, very easy. Um, but what this is really doing is it's taking a username, I don't have to provide the password. And the other argument is a function. So you give it a function, okay? And it will execute this function as this user. How does it know, right? If I was guest, how does it know that guest can sudo to any message? But you have to have a sudoers config file somewhere. So we need to create some sort of XML config file in slash DB system security config or whatever it is. Um, and you know, the equivalent dashboard tools and admin client tools so people can easily manage this sudoers comp. Um, and it's kind of interesting because obviously you can only update the sudoers comp if you're, if you're a DBA, but you can grant someone in there the right to sudo to become a DBA, so then they can update it as well. So think about that a little bit. Same as in Unix, so anyone who can see these are root right? got the right thing. So I think that's in terms of how we have more fine going control over dynamic execution. I think that's one, one step. And the other one is obviously the functions. How do I have functions that I can call where I don't have to be DEA? Um, well, I think this in a way solves it, right? Why not? Um, be able to sudo to a DBA if I want to call a restricted function. And in my sudo as config, I can have information in there about the function they're going to call potentially. What What is the limitation of the function they're going to call? And that's, it's a little bit trickier because here we're passing a, a function kind of anonymously or in the name. Whereas in Unix, you would give it a executable file. So you'd say, I don't know, slash bin slash true. And in sudo as it said, this user can sudo to here and execute bin slash true. Um, that works well in units here, it's a little bit trickier because this is potentially quite a lot of exquery scripts, so what can they do, what can't they do? I think we just list function names. Yeah. Basically, in, in this block, we know whether they're calling that function or not because we'll change the context in the exquery so that there's then a security list that's checked when they call a function. Um, I don't think it will be too hard. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the implication is in performance, so I have to be quite careful when we do that. Uh, but I think that's how I'm proposing to lock down functions. So you have to sudo to a user, and that user, as well as saying you can sudo to that user, you can send sudo to that user, but you don't <coughs> functions. Or you can run with functions, or whatever. Um, so there's one last part, and this won't take very long, because this is really also talking about future work. Awesome. Uh, so this is back on time. Uh, so we talked about uh, the correctness of how permissions were signed exist. We talked about identity, how you escalate your identity. Um, but there's one thing that I think is still needs some attention, um, which is precision. So um, at the moment, on collections and resources that exist, the way that we manage the dates and times of those things is a bit lacking, in my opinion, uh, and a bit haphazard as well. I find that in several places, we sometimes update the last modified time, and then sometimes we don't, uh, depending on the actions. So this needs to be overhauled, basically. Um, so at the moment, for collections, we only have created date. So <laughs> I don't really know when my collections changed or something happened with my collection. I just know when it's created. Which is, yeah. It's done up to now. I think we can do better. Um, so look, resources a bit earlier have created date and last modified, but is that last modified when it was copied, or when its permissions were changed, or when the content changed, or, or what? I'm not sure. And it turns out that it varies and exists when that's updated. Sometimes it is updated for a copy, sometimes it's not. Uh, so we should probably decide and be consistent there. Um, but it's not anybody's fault, particularly. It's how the code base has evolved over time and lots of people changing things in there. So we just need to make this solid. Um, so at the moment, we know who did something, right? We're very good at knowing who did something. We're storing ACLs and users and groups and all of this kind of stuff. So we know who did it because the permissions tell us who can do it. 
We don't know when they did it particularly. We have an idea, but it's a bit kind of you're really made in your brain back right here. Um, so we need more precision. So I had a look because I'm a big fan of stealing off Unix. Uh, it's tried and true. About how Unix does this. Um, so Unix stores at least three times. So it stores the access time, uh, the modification time of the content, and then the change <coughs> time. The change time is both the modification of the content and also the file permissions or the mode or that kind of thing. So by comparing these two, you can work out whether the content has changed or whether it was just the permissions. So you have a lot of information about did they change the content, did they change the metadata, and there are rules about when you update which of these fields when you move resources and copy resources, and basically I want to implement all of that, so it's very accurate and very true. Um, also in Unix, not always, but creative data, which is something we concern ourselves with and exists. Um, they didn't always have creative data, so it's only on the most recent file systems in Unix that they actually store the creative data for file as well. Um, so if you look at uh, ZFS or ext 4 or ButterFS, they'll store a creative data, but if you look at Extended 2, they don't have it. Or UFS, that doesn't have anything. Um, so I just think that we should adopt this model wholesale, pretty much. There's one thing in there that concerns me about adopting this model, uh, which is access time. So access time is updated every time you <coughs> read a resource. Now, if I run an X query that's querying a million documents across my database, and that X query is very fast, due to all the lovely high speed indexes. Um, but I've updated a million, I've touched a million documents, I have to update the access time on a million documents. What's that going to do to my query performance? Can I do that synchronously, maybe? What does that mean for time? Is the time correct? I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of things I need to think about with regards to access time. But end time and C time is relatively easy, because that's only double rights. Um, so I just need to think about this a little bit, but this is what I'd like to bring in. So this is the end of my presentation. So everybody please. Testing in 2.1 with uh, created an app library basically that just has a query in it that queries things in other collections within the repository. Would, would these new security fixes fix the problem even having where that X query that's in that app directory can't access the content in another um, higher up directory? It basically, has gets okay. the results back. I think I'd have to look at the, the modes that you've assigned to understand exactly the problem that you're having. But what you're, just, what you're describing in terms of what you want should be entirely possible. Yeah, just that it, if you put the X query on the file system and run it from there, it works fine. Uh, if, you put it, if you put it inside of an app directory, you can upgrade the file. Mm -hmm. and then, well, that's just the context from. Context from. So if you store it into a collection, the initial context of the query goes into the collection. Yeah. And if you run it from a file system or via REST or something, then the initial context is the entire data. So the initial context changes, it depends on how you run the track function and stuff in there. You get to work and put it outside. So we'll try to track the whole thing down. So maybe I should point out that none of this applies to anything stored outside of the database. <laughs> <laughs> because I have yeah, yeah, no yeah, control no, I know that. I know that. <laughs> uh, uh, this is all for resources inside the database. But can you achieve what you want?